So this is Ethereum algebra with Kun Hee Cho. <laughs> and with current children. Uh, yeah. Um, let me pull up what I wanted to say. Okay. You can do whatever you want. So are we should be consistent. Now? Yeah, we can start. Okay. So hello everybody. So he asked me to do community algebra with y'all. So I really enjoy community algebra. It's mm -hmm. one of the first things I study in math. So uh, one of the prerequisites of studying algebraic geometry is studying creative algebra. It's almost impossible now to do algebraic geometry without creative algebra. So in my, in my research, it's more or less a proper subset of algebraic geometry. So I study algebraic number theory, but it is studying the number theory properties of algebraic geometric objects. Okay, so it's hard to define what community of algebra really is. It's more or less all abstract. So we define abstract object with abstract operations and then try to understand properties. So the book I will use is Introduction to Commutative Algebra with, by uh, Atia and McDonald. I really like this book because it's self-contained and uh, uh, the problems are very good. They get you into the mindset of doing algebra and then seeing what's important, what the most important theorems are, uh, and it shows you kind of in the future what kind of math is dependent on this type of material. Okay, so let's start with the uh, actual math. So start off with the rings and ideas. What is a ring? We'll call ring A is a non empty set. So it also has two operations addition and multiplication, where the addition is associated. So A plus B plus C is A plus B plus C for all A and C in A. Uh, there's an idea. So X plus zero equals zero for all X and A. And then there is a negative. All X and A, there exists X A such that X plus negative X X to zero. Okay. Finally, uh, addition is commutative. So X plus Y is the same as Y plus X. Oh, X comma Y. That is addition. Uh, I think I don't, I have not missed any properties. Multiplication is such that associated, we have x times y times z plus x times y times z for well, x, y, and z in A, and also um, distributive. Uh, x times a plus b is x times a plus x times b for all a, b, x, and a. So addition is commutative, but multiplication is not. If 
is not necessarily commutative. If in the ring you've defined multiplication is also commutative, then we say the whole ring is commutative. Is commutative. If and only if x times y is y times x for x and y and a. Okay. Um, and another thing you notice is that uh, not every element in the ring has a multiplicative inverse. If it does, it's called a unit. Y in a such that X times Y is Y times X. And then we can call Y to be X inverse. Okay. So uh, we define commutative rings and let's give some examples. So uh, zero. Uh, is of course a uh, com commutative ring, right? Uh, Z set of integers. It's a commutative ring. We have Q set of rational number is a commutative ring. Uh, we have R set of reals. Your favorite C set of complex numbers. It is not hard to check that all of these are in fact rings. Okay. Okay. So given a ring, let X be an indeterminate. We have A bracket X is set of all polynomials with coefficient in A, that is a ring also. Uh, let's say A is a ring again, let's say N is a fixed positive integer. We have a set of all n by n matrices called mn a with uh, entries in a is also a ring. Um, you probably will not have mn of a is commutative, but it's still a ring. Okay, uh, so there are other examples of rings. As you do more and more complicated commutative algebra, you have more operations. But uh, for now, these are the most elementary. So usually when you have objects in math, you also define maps between them. Say definition, a ring called morphus. Uh, let's just say a and b, b rings, ring homomorphs is a map, let's say b from a to b, such that we have b of x plus y is phi of x is b of y, and phi of x times y. This is for all x comma y and a, and you need the final um, property that the identity in a goes to the identity in b. Okay. So did you require that the identity exists in the definition of the? Uh, that's a good point. Um, it's a good point. Did I miss it? Yeah. I did this. Yeah, so 
then we have all ranks have A. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so these are rank homomorphism. So these are the natural maps for two ranks. Okay, so let's move on to the next very important objects. So again, let A be a ring. If A is a ring, um, we have the ideal pi is a non empty subset of A. such that we have if x comma y is an i, then x plus y is an i, and if x is an i and r is an a, then r times x is an i. So <clears throat> natural property is that zero is the element of all ideals because if i is an ideal let x be an i then zero times x which is zero is an i by the second property Okay, so examples of ideals. So let A be a ring. The most simplest examples are zero and A ideals. Okay, if A is a set of integers, then you can have z is an ideal, you could have 3z is an ideal, 4z, and z for all. n is an ideal. Where n z is a set of all terms n times z such that z is a z. Okay, so What's the difference between an ideal and a ring? So ideals don't necessarily need to have the number one. So you can see like 2z, 3z, 4z. There's no multiplicative identity that distinguishes an ideal from a ring. It's a more general uh, concept than just a ring. So um, let's say in the case where let's say a is the set of reals, so there are only two only two ideals, zero and r itself. So such an example is called a field. We will get to this later, so don't worry about it. Uh, another example is let's say a is a ring. So consider a bracket x, set of polynomials like we talked about earlier. Um, then let's say uh, f of x is an a bracket x. Then we can say um, f of x, which is set of all terms of x, so I said g of x is an a bracket x is an idea. In other words, a set, a set of all polynomials which are divisible by f of x. Um, another idea is uh, is set. Uh, I'm sorry. Let's say that 
let C be an A, let I C be all f of x in A bracket A, such that f of C equals zero. I C is also an ideal. Okay. Another example is let f. I'm sorry. Let's say v from A to B be a ring homomorphism, then the kernel of phi, which is all the x in A that map to zero in B is an ideal. So this is extremely important. All right. And then finally for my last example, let S be a subset of A, define this set S to equal all terms of the form such that N is finite. And SI is an S, AI is an A. So you can also prove that this is an idea. This is called the idea generated by S. And if S is a set of size one, we say the ideal generated by S is a principal idea. Okay. What do you mean the set of the size? Is a set of size one. So if S is a set with only one element, then the ideal generated by S is the principal ideal. It's um, terminology, I guess. So you mean the number of elements in the generating a set, you just call it the size, right? Mm -hmm. So it. let's say, I don't know. And S is the same as A, which is A times X, such that Any more questions? So this is not a mathematical question, but I'm just uh, asking your kind of inspiration on those definitions that, so what's the point of considering the ideas? So what's your... Uh... That is a good question. Um, I think it has a historical significance. I guess, um, I think ideals and the study of ideals were, I guess, introduced or improved by Noita. Um, I don't really know the inspiration she had. I think she was trying to build up the uh, background to maybe do some algebraic geometric um, topics. Certainly ideals come up a lot in algebraic geometry. Um, they, it's intri intrinsically linked to fields and field theory, um, varieties over field, um, how varieties can break up as geometric objects is intimately linked with how ideals, how many ideals they have in corresponding ring. Like um, we'll talk about the spectrum of a ring soon, maybe today, maybe next week. Um, it kind of gives you an idea between ideals of a ring and uh, some ideas of geometric concepts, things like that. Okay, so it's very abstract now, but uh, it's very um, fundamental, I would say. 
Um, go ahead now. So let's move on to operations on ID. So if we have, um, I'll say first let's go mm -hmm. quotient breaks. Uh, so let's say consider the following one big example. Say uh, A is the ring Z, set of integers. Um, every Z and Z is either even or odd. In other words, if you divide C by 2, there is a remainder of 0 or 1. If you divide zero, sorry, z by three, there is a remainder of zero, one, or two. If you divide z by four, etc. So to make this concept more abstract, um, this is what a quotient ring kind of tells us. So. Given an ideal is I of a ring A, define a new ring A mod I. The elements of the form X plus I. So we say that X plus I is the same as Y plus I, if and only if X minus Y is an I. So uh, if you kind of want to see a motivating example, so let's say A is Z, I is 2Z, the set of even integers, then uh, A over I is Z mod 2Z. So if you divide any integer by 2, you should only get two ideas, if, even or odd. This is a set A plus 2Z, such that A is in Z. So A plus 2Z is the same as B plus 2Z, if and only if A minus B is in 2Z is even. So we have uh, Z mod 2Z is 0 plus 2Z. It, there is a 1 plus 2z, but 2 plus 2z is the same as 0 plus 2z. 3 plus 2z is the same thing as 1 plus 2z, because if you subtract 2 minus 0, you get two, You get an even number. If you subtract 1 by 3, you get an even number. So this is a ring of two elements. And we got this as a question array. We kind of folded the integers on itself. This is in fact a ring with the operations. If you add x plus i to y plus i, this is x plus y i. If you add, sorry, if you multiply x plus y, x plus i and y plus i, you get x y. Plus I. And from this, it's not hard to prove that this is in fact a ring. The zero of A mod I is zero plus I. The one of A mod I is one plus I. And the negative of X plus I is negative X plus I, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And Moving on. So we defined quotient rings, we defined ideals. There is a correspondence between these two.
This is the first proposition. of a Tim McDonald. There is a one-to-one -one order preserver correspondence between ideals of a mother and the ideals of a that contain it. This is extremely important. Um, the proof which I will sketch is let phi be the map going from A to A mod I. If we call this to be the ideals of A containing I, and there's a map going this way. If you take an idea, let's say J here, then we have an ideal J mod I, which is X plus I such that X is in J. There's a map going the other direction. So if you have an ideal J hat, this will correspond to the ideal phi inverse of J twiddle, not hat, twiddle. And you can prove that this is in fact an order preserving one to one correspondence. Um, a couple more ideas, and then we'll just jump into problems. So um, let's say zero divisors. And the array is zero divides. A is an element X and A such that there exists Y in A. Y is non zero such that X times Y equals zero. And this isn't a very natural idea. You haven't, you probably haven't seen something like this before. Um, for example, I consider, let's say, A to be Z mod 60, then 2 plus 60 times 3 plus 60 is 6 times, six, sorry, 6 plus 6z, which is 0 plus 6. And so 2 plus 6z, 3 plus 6z are 0 divided. Um, we will say a ring which has no zero divisors is an integral domain. So an example of a zero of an integral domain is Z, R, C, Q, um, C bracket X, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So in your definition of the integral domain, so did you include the commutativity for the multiplication or not? Uh, from now on, let's say all our rings are commutative. Okay. If that's okay. okay. Yep. Um, I, you're right. There is an idea of left zero divisor, right zero divisor. Um, but for now, if we say everything's commutative, that idea is just reductive. A similar idea of being zero from a non-zero element is um, not positive elements.
an important element x of a ring a an element such that x to the n equals zero for some n greater than the dozen one. So I think clearly zero is an important element, but there are um, non-zero nilpotent elements sometimes. If we say A is a set of two by two matrices in R, let's say, let's say X is the matrix zero, zero, one, zero, zero, then X squared is in fact the zero matrix. So clearly no potent. But A is not commutative, right? Yeah, you're right. Uh, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head an element which is no potent in a commutative ring from the ones I've given you. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, it's, it's a good point. Um, we can say A is Z mod four Z. Let's say X is two plus four Z. Then X squared is four plus four, which is zero. Yeah. So there's a commutative ring, but uh, we have a nilpotent element. Clearly nilpotent implies zero divisor, but zero divisor does not imply nilpotent because counter example is um, X is two plus six in Z minus six. This is not a no potent element, but it is a zero device. Okay, and right. Let's move on to units and, oh, no, no. One lot. No, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Let's go to units. A B ring. A unit of A is an element X such that there exists Y in A with X times Y equals one. Okay, so for some example, uh, if A is Z, then the units are plus or minus one. If let's say A is R, then the units are every element except zero. So in the case where the units of A are A without zero, we say A is a field. We'll go to fields very soon. So actually we'll define that. Field is a ring where every non-zero element is a unit. So this is a very clear definition. We can also say the field is a ring with only two ideas, zero and a. Now, we gave you the concept in terms of rings. How do we give you the concept in terms of ideals? So you exclude the, just a singleton set zero, uh, which is not a field, right? You exclude it already. Yeah. How about if I don't say a ring is specifically the zero ring, don't assume it is. Yeah, 
So um, the zero ring is not a field it's because it does not follow this example here. Um, you need to have at least two ideals and you will have to have at least one maximum ideal, um, which we'll define now, but uh, the zero ring does not have any maximum ideals. Yes, thank you. Define, ah, sorry. Definition, an ideal on the ring A is prime if given X and Y in A such that X, Y is in A, then either X is in A or Y is in A. We can equivalently say that A mod I is an integral domain. Okay, so what are some examples of prime ideals in rings? Let's say let um, A to be Z, then I can be zero, and it can be any uh, multiple of Z by primes. PZ, where P is prime. So notice that I equals four Z is not prime because uh, Z mod four Z is not an integral domain. We showed two plus four Z is in fact a zero divisor. And next we have maximizes. Ideal I in a ring A is a maximal ideal if it is, as I said, maximal in the set of ideals. If you give me an ideal J such that, let's say I lives in J and J lives in A, and you must have I is equal to J or J is equal to A. This is a kind of a messy um, idea to work with. A clear way to see this is A mod I is a field. So a ring with no with every element, every non-zero element is a unit. Okay. So, and one final thing I would like to say is that all non-zero rings have at least one maximizer. Okay. So, um, I think let's do some problem, if that's okay. Is that okay with you, Gorni? Sure. Okay. Uh, I think we've done enough theory for one for one day. Um, open the Tim McDonald. Let's do some elementary questions for now. This is 
chapter one, number one. <coughs> so it says x the important element of a. plus x is a unit. Reduce that. The sum of a unit and important element is also unit. Okay, so how will we solve this? So um, let A be a ring and X and A is nubbled. Thus, we have X to the N is equal to zero for some is positive integer N. So, how do we prove one plus x is a unit? So um, it kind of looks like calculus that this looks like the Taylor expansion of one over one plus x. Looks something like one minus x plus x squared minus x cubed x to the four x to the fifth, et cetera, et cetera. Eventually, I will um, something like this. But I was just told that x to the n is zero, so all this is zero. So actually, one over one plus x is simply one minus x plus x squared plus negative one to the n minus one, x to the n minus one. And this is in fact an element of A. So we are done. So one plus x times one over one plus x, x times one minus x, this does in fact equal one. So, one plus x is invertible. So, even though you use the power series, but we do not need to actually worry about the convergence because from some point it should be zero. So, this is actually quite tricky argument. Yeah. So, uh, it kind of gives you a, a purely algebraic way of understanding how one over one plus x behaves. You could equivalently have done times, I don't know, f equals what? Well, we can say one plus x times one minus x is one minus x squared. One minus x squared times one plus x squared is one minus x to the four. One minus x to the four, one plus x to the four is one minus x to the eighth. And you can keep going this way, you will eventually do, I don't know, one over x to the a, one plus x to the a will be one minus x to the two a, two a will be greater than or equal to the n, so x to the two a will be equal to zero, so one minus x to a minus x to the a is one. So this is a unit. Mm -hmm. And therefore, one minus x is a unit. Okay. And so that's the first part of the question. How do we prove the second part? So let's start over by saying let u be a unit. 
I would say x in a such that x to n equals zero for some n greater equal to one greater than equal to one. Then we can say then uh, that u plus x is a unit. Why is this true? Because u inverse times u plus x is u inverse times u plus u inverse times x. This is one plus u inverse x. And by the fact that x is no potent, so u inverse x is also no potent. Because if x to the n equals zero, then u to the minus one, x to the n power, u to the negative n times x to the n, which is zero. But we proved one plus the no potent is a unit already. And we are done. So you just saw your first community algebra question. Nice. Um, let's try this. Okay, let's say, uh, let's try number seven. Mm -hmm. do we solve? So we have a ring and it has a nice condition where every element x has some power n associated to it so that x to the n is x again. How do we prove that every prime ideal is maximal? So it's not necessary that a prime ideal is maximal. There are certainly prime ideals which are not maximal but in this case every prime ideal is maximal. How do we prove that? So let P be a prime ideal of A. Then we know that A mod P is an integral domain. To prove that P is maximal, I want to prove I want to prove that a my p is a field. How do we do that? Well, x plus p b in a my p. If x plus p is not zero, we need to show that x plus p is a unit. Okay, so we have that x equals x to the n for some n greater than, uh, sorry, I think it was strictly greater than one. Uh, strictly greater than one, yeah. So actually x plus p is the same as x to n plus p. 
That's very nice. So how do we use this information? That means that x to the n plus p minus x plus p is x to the n minus x plus p. This is the same as x times x to the n minus 1 plus p, which is x plus p times x to the n minus 1 plus p. This should equal 0. All right, and so what can we conclude? So from the fact that a mod p is an integral domain, and we have the product of two elements equals 0, that means x plus p equals 0, or x to the n minus 1 minus 1 plus p equals 0. So if x plus p equals 0, that's fine. That could work. I don't know. Or x to the n minus 1 minus 1 plus p equals 0. That means that x to the n minus 1 plus p minus 1 plus p equals 0. And so x to the minus x to the n minus 1 plus p equals 1 plus p. But the left hand side is simply x plus p to the n minus 1 power. And therefore, we found an element which multiplies by x plus p. Get you 1. And so, Either x plus p equals 0, or x plus p does equal 0. And thus, we have x plus p, p to the n minus 2 is 1 plus p. So x plus p is a unit. And we're done. So the converse seems clearly false in the sense that even though uh, we assume prime ideas, all prime ideas are maximal, it does not imply the assumption that we use in this argument, right? There are a bunch uh, of... Certainly not. Yeah, certainly because not. Because if you take a field, every prime ideal is maximal. Mm -hmm. But that does not mean this is true. For example, uh, converse is false. Let A be a set of reals. Then the only prime maximal deal is uh, zero. X to the n never equals x. Ah, sorry. I'll say x to the n equals x if and only if x equals zero or one. But that's not that's not what uh, yeah. the hypothesis said. Yeah. Then I, just this is my curiosity that then how can come up uh, how can one come up with this kind of assumption to have this strong implication from prime idea to be maximal? So this condition seems somehow. Mysterious for me. Yeah, so uh, for example, for a field. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you mean the hypothesis yeah. of the question? Yeah, my curiosity is how can one come up with this hypothesis to get so, the implication? So, first of all, we have Boolean rings. There are rings mm -hmm. such that mm -hmm. x squared I see. x for all I see. x in. I'm sorry. Something like this. Um, uh -huh. For Got example, it. nice. Two z, two z, z mod two z. Something like that. So, uh -huh. Uh -huh. 
Got it. I don't think everybody comes across them like this, but it's possible. Uh, there are some interesting uh, sub examples uh, like this. Got it. Yeah. Nice. That might be of interest to some people. Uh -huh. uh, what should we do next? So time is almost over, so you can go over one more problem if you want, or we can start over here. Um, it's up to you because you already cover a lot. If you feel, if you want to cover uh, one more thing, you might one, one less, yeah, because I said Boolean. Got it. So, so let's say A is a Boolean ring. Let's say that means x equals x for all x and a. Prove the following. Let's say 1, 2x equals 0 for all x and a. Let's say every prime ideal is maximal. And a mod, sorry, every prime I think, let's say p is maximal, and a mod p is a ring of two elements. And finally, every finitely generated ideal is principal. So how do we prove the first statement? So x squared equals x for all x a. That means that 2 squared equals 2 for all. Actually, sorry, 2 squared equals 2. But that means 4 equals 2. And if you subtract both sides by 2, you get 2 equals 0. So in fact, 2 times x is the same as 0 times x which is zero for all x in a. So the first part is done. All right, and so next, number two. Let p be a prime idea. I will prove that a mod p is a, sorry, keep saying set, it's a ring of size two. Okay, how do we do this? So, um, P is a prime ideal. All prime ideals are proper, so there exists X in A such that X is not in P. I claim X plus P is the same as one plus P. How do I do that? Well, um, X plus P is the same as X squared plus P from the fact that the ring is Boolean. So if I subtract both sides, I get x squared minus x plus p. And you can divide this this way. And finally, we have this division. This is equal to 0 plus p. So either x plus p equals 0, but that would imply x is equal to p which is what we said was not true, or x minus one plus p equals zero. But that would mean that x plus p is one plus p, which is what I wanted to prove. So a mod p is the set zero plus p, one plus p. Okay. So that proves number one and two. 
this final problem is very hard to come up with on your own. There is a proof in the later question. It gives you the hint and just lets you solve it on your own. So I will recreate the proof on my own here. Let i be the ideal generated by, let's say, x1, x2, minus one, x n. Let me check. So, I is ideal. So, I claim actually that I is the ideal generated by xn minus 1 plus xn plus xn minus 1 xn. So you would modify the last element by I modified it by this. Got it. So got this it. is one element. If this is true, then we are done. Yep. So uh, I will call this new ideal J. Clearly, J is contained in I. I need to prove that I is contained in J. It is enough to show xn minus 1 and xn r in that j. So um, we have xn minus 1 plus xn plus xn minus 1, xn is in j. And so if you multiply this by xn minus 1, what do you get? This is equal to xn minus 1 squared plus xn minus 1 xn plus xn minus 1 squared xn. This is the same thing as xn minus 1 uh, plus xn minus 1 xn plus xn minus 1 xn because y squared equals y for all y in a. And then this is equal to xn minus 1 plus 2 times xn minus 1 xn. But from a, we know that 2 times y equals 0 for all y in a. So that means this is equal to just xn minus 1. So actually, xn minus 1 is in j. If we do the same process, xn is in j. So we went from an ideal with n generators to an ideal with n minus 1 generator. And then we can just keep doing this until we go down to one element. And so QED. So these problems right now are very abstract, but if you keep building up the theory, um, Etienne McDonald used these abstract algebraic ideas to talk about algebraic geometric um, concepts like we will talk about um, the spectrum of a ring and sheaf in the very far future, but it's a relevant part of the book. Yeah, I try to imagine because actually the principal idea domain correspond to the uh, just algebraic curve in fact, just a dimension one variety. So that once we take the sub variety by taking the idea of shape, then actually you prove that it is actually correspond to the dimension one variety. So it's exactly. And uh, I think that 
proof is in the textbook. Okay, I think we can finish over here. So let me stop to record. Okay.